All right, we're going to get started. It's 225. Uh, my name is Matt Fryer. I'll be presenting here with uh, Wes Kirkpatrick. He's farms in Arkansas. He was an extension for a number of years, and so uh, he's, he's probably got just as much credibility to be up here as I do. And, uh, he's certainly got more experience in utilizing cover crops. So we're just going to talk about cover crops and, and cotton and kind of a little bit about Arkansas's journey um, in uh, soil health and cover crops. And, and I'm just going to kind of I always like to put things in context when it comes to soil health because it's pretty vast and so that's what I'm going to touch on but first I got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, Dr. Mike Daniels, our uh, Discovery Farm Program uh, Specialist, Water Quality. Dr. Bill Roberts, Center Extension Cotton Specialist. Dr. Trent Roberts has done a bunch of work in cover crops and soil fertility. Um, and Dr. Chris Bry, our soil physicist, he's done a lot of work. And so I started in this position as soil health instructor about a year ago. And these, all these folks have really laid a foundation for me to come in and start running with the program. And um, that they've built relationships and developed the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance with a number of producers that are used, utilizing cover crops and no-till. And so uh, without them uh, doing the legwork, uh, I wouldn't have the program that I have right now that I'm, I'm running with. So. So just to kind of get in, I always show this slide. I'm, I'm sure people that seen many of my talks are tired of seeing it, but what's soil health? NRCS definition is defined as the uh, continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And so you think, well, that's pretty broad, and I would agree with you. Um, depending on the situation, it may not be easy to define, it's certainly kind of hard to quantify things, the benefits that we see from soil health and cover crops. But I think you talk to some of our farmers, some of the observations, uh, the benefits that they see on their farm is a little easier to observe than it is to quantify or study. And so when we talk about soil health, there's really three main areas of study in soil health, the biological, chemical, and physical aspects of soil. And you've got, we've got lists there of uh, all the, some of the components in each of those areas. But really soil health encompasses all three of those areas and if you leave one out, uh, you're not really giving soil health the due diligence that, that it needs. Because all these factors really play a role together. They all, they're intertwined, the soil um, the system relies on all these things to, to function properly. My training's in soil fertility and so when I heard the term soil health, I began looking up things and there's a lot of weight put on the biological aspects. And, and I'm like, what's earthworms and these microorganisms that we really don't even know anything about? You know, what, how can, why does that even matter? And so I really didn't, it didn't make sense to me and I started connecting the dots. You know, without all this biological activity going on, or soil physical properties that, that we can measure and see uh, and, and certainly see an effect on the crop, those soil physical properties couldn't uh, improve without the biological aspect working well. Um, and so it, it all plays a role and really a key in, in every one of these uh, areas is, or, is organic matter. If we can improve organic matter um, then we can improve all these areas of, of, of the soil and overall soil health. And so I've heard people say it's easy to build soil organic matter and this is one of those context things I like to put into context. I heard a, uh, a guy from Boot Hill, Missouri say in three years he raises soil organic matter from uh, one and a half percent to six or seven percent with the cover crops and no-till and it kind of made my skin crawl just as a, a soils guy but but just to put things in context it, it's, it's difficult to build organic matter down in Arkansas in the south uh, but it can be done um, because we all know that as, as temperature increases soil organic matter is going to decrease because decomposition is going to happen longer periods of the year. So you look at plant hardness zone map up northern states, they can convert about 30% of their plant residues into organic matter and move down in Arkansas, Louisiana area of around 10%. So when you do a little bit of math on that, we have a 10,000 pound cereal rye cover crop. We know about an acre of soil, six inches deep, weighs about two million pounds. You do the math, up in Minnesota, that's about 0.175% soil organic matter increased in a year. For Arkansas, that's five one hundredths. And so that may not seem like a lot, but if you're on a sandy soil that's only got about half a percent to begin with, 
five one hundreds is probably quite a big deal. So, but well, we can build soil organic matter. It's just going to take a while. Um, I think one thing's for certain that you're not going to build organic matter without cover crops. Um, Dr. Slayton's got some long-term fertility trials, 14 plus years, and rice soybean rotation. Rice is a heavy biomass producing crop. Soil organic matter is flat uh, those four years, no-till. Hadn't been tilled in 14 years. So we've got to have cover crops in our systems to build soil organic matter, and, and I really believe we can do it. Because 10,000 pounds is very easily uh, achievable. So this brings us to factors that we can change in soils and factors that we can't change. Factors that we can't change, climate, topography, the texture of our soils, and the parent material. But things that we can change, soil pH, organic matter, soil structure. Um, you know, I think we all know the, uh, and would agree, uh, many of us in the room, on the benefits of soil health and cover crops and no-till. That's why we're here at this conference. Um, and, so, and so again, why does, it, why does it matter? Why does soil health matter? Why does cover crops and no-till? Environmental issues, increased water use efficiency, profitability is a big key. You talk to many farmers. I mean, if, you, if we can be environmentally sustainable, but if we're not uh, economically sustainable, then it doesn't matter. Um, and I think this last point here is a big deal. Um, I think soil health really applies a lot of principles that we all agree on. You go back to any weed classes that you've taken, what are some um, factors that <coughs> increase weed seed germination, excess sunlight, soil temperature fluctuations, excess nitrogen. Um, what are we doing when we till the soil? We're getting, this, we're getting the sunlight in there. We don't have any plants growing to take up any excess nitrogen. We've got massive temperature fluctuations because the sun and nighttime, the temperature's fluctuating. Well, we got a cover crop, we're knocking all those out, so we're reducing weed and seed germination. When we're tilling the soil, we're destroying, destroying soil structure. And so when, we, when we're implementing no-till and cover crops, we've got roots growing in the soil, activating that biological activity, um, improving soil structure, infiltration rates. And so it's a system it really implements a lot of practices that we all, general uh, principles that we all agree on. And so I think it's a good thing. But I think we need to put things in context and have goals when, when we're implementing these practices. And so when I talk to producers or consultants that uh, have questions about uh, implementing cover crops, I always ask, first thing I ask is, what's your goal? What are you trying to achieve with cover crops? Sometimes they don't know. They just want to do it because it's kind of a popular thing. You want to try it, see if they can see any kind of benefit. But I think we've got to have goals. Um, and so if you want um, improved uh, weed control, you want to improve your infiltration, organic matter, all those, erosion is going to be uh, strong suits, are going to, that's going to be a strong suit for grasses. And so don't think that all these that legumes or brassicas can uh, improve on, on some of these factors. It's just not necessarily a mix that I would say has to be in, in a cover crop mix. Um, but if, if infiltration is, is your main goal, I would say we'd want to have a, gr a grass in there in some percentage, regardless of the cash crop, to, to improve infiltration. Um, because we've got higher um, root system production, higher carbon to nitrogen ratio in that cover crop to sit on the soil surface, shade the, shade the soil, and help. Uh, help uh, weed control, whereas you have legumes, if, you're, if your goal is in, uh, infiltration, uh, a, lot, a lot more limited root system, um, a little bit lower biomass production, and so that's not a, a crop that we would put in uh, for that specific goal. So again, just, just knowing your goal, uh, what you're after, uh, is crucial. Um, another thing to put things in context is in Arkansas, we never recommend um, monoculture cover and cash crop. We don't ever recommend a solid grass cover in front of a grass cash crop or a solid legume in front of a legume cash crop because we can run into several issues. Um, this is a study by our corn specialist um, and his technician sitting on the front row. They, they did this a few years ago. This is actually a, a seed treatment study and a cover crop system where they're terminating sugar rye uh, at three different stages or three different timings. One was about 10 weeks before planting, one was four weeks, and one was after after planting. 
Um, the early terminated corn is there on the right, uh, planted green, seal rise on the left. And so there's a, there's a big growth difference. You can see the plots stick out like sore thumb. Uh, early terminated corn is a lot healthier, a lot taller. When you look at yields, early terminated versus planted green, 50 bushel yield drag. Now this was uh, a heavy seeding rate. It's, I think he said, I think uh, Jason said uh, about 100 pounds of cereal rye. So that's almost double uh, what we'd recommend drilling. Uh, so it, it's a heavy seeding rate. That high carbon to nitrogen ratio was there. The, the cereal rye was very mature, headed out. So we know the soil microbes are way better at taking up nitrogen than the plant is. And so that's, that's what we kind of attribute this yield drag to. And so again, monocultures, cover versus our cover in a cash crop monoculture is uh, avoidable. Other things, you know, sometimes you hear that your, your beneficials outnumber your pests and you won't have any issues. I think we still need to be scouting, um, especially starting out until we get comfortable with the, with the system. Um, and so this is just some stink bug damage in corn following uh, winter field peas, so Austrian winter peas as a cover crop. One more thing, um, nematodes in Arkansas is, is, is a growing issue. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, some producers, it's, it's a big issue. This is a greenhouse study that uh, one of our pathologists is working with nematodes and uh, Dr. Roberts did in, uh, where they took pots of soil, inoculated them with uh, 6,000 root knot nematode eggs, planted various um, cover crops, and I don't know if y'all can see those, black oats, kale, cereal rye, crimson clover, turnip, Austrian winter pea, and barley. And they come back in 60 days after they planted and counted those, uh, the number of nematodes. And so these numbers above the bars, 2.7 all the way up to 75.8, that's just an X factor. So multiply that by the 6,000 that they inoculated with and that gives you the number of nematodes they found in those pots. And so if that number is above one, that's, that's saying that that, that that plant has a potential host uh, for, the, for root knot nematode. And so I also must say that conditions in the greenhouse, they made it conducive to root knot nematode reproduction. So they were trying to <coughs> grow nematodes. And so um, but it still gives the potential of potential uh, root knot nematode increases. So black oats is our lowest. I think that's pretty encouraging actually because uh, black oats perform really well in poorly drained soils. We have a lot of that in Arkansas. And so um, that would be a good option for grass in an Arkansas system. And cereal rye is pretty low as well. So where we're at now, you know, that was just kind of putting things in context. Um, in my position, uh, working under Grant that uh, Dr. Daniels um, secured from NRCS, we're looking at cover crop demonstrations across the Delta where we split fields in half comparing cover crops and no-till versus no cover crop. We've got about 20 sites. Um, these are the counties we've got. I think there's one or two other counties that I don't have in here that we uh, just learned about that it's got established. Um, we've got about 20 sites. We're doing a bunch of sampling, um, cover crop biomass, and uh, and the spring infiltration uh, measurements with this device here, um, bulk density, soil texture analysis, doing nematode samples in the fall and in the spring to track uh, nematode uh, population increases or, or decreases, and also looking at uh, free, uh, I forgot the term, but nematodes that aren't parasitic nematodes are, are, the, are the ones that we don't typically consider parasitic. And some others, we're doing economic analysis on these as well. <coughs> and so we're just trying to learn from our producers that are already doing it um, on, on a field scale. It's just three year demonstrations that we're working with. And so some things we know about soils that's important, environmental and economic benefits are, are uh, plentiful as well as agronomic benefits. The things you need to remember, context matters, um, your goals matter, we need to keep goals in mind. Um, and some of those goals are long-term goals. You're not gonna build organic matter 
in just a couple of years, but we can definitely improve on things. And, I, and again, there's no cookie cutter recommendation. Uh, it's taken me a while to get handles on, on uh, trying to grasp cover crops and, um, and no-till systems. Here's just some fact sheets we've got. Um, Dr. Roberts has developed this fact sheet with a number of different uh, cover crop species, ideal planting window, planting um, seed, seed weight to plant, um, some ones we, do, we never recommend, uh, annual ryegrass, blue lupin, uh, canola or rape, we never recommend those um, for uh, weed, uh, problematic weed potential in those cover crops. And so I'll turn it over to Wes.